Hello everyone, this is China Paradigm, where we, Dashi Consulting, interview seasoned entrepreneurs in China. Hello everyone, I'm Matthew David, the founder of Dashi Consulting and this podcast, China Paradigm. I am today with Annie Gro. So we found out about your business online through LinkedIn. I think someone shared about what you were doing uh, in, in, in Paris, I, I guess in Europe now, actually, because you have an office in Barcelona if I understand uh, correctly. So we, we looked at, into your business after this post about payment, payment system. Um, so you are managing um, the business, uh, a company called SigPay, and you are the founder or co-founder, you may tell us more about it later on. And uh, this uh, business is doing, uh, is helping uh, companies to um, monetize with uh, the Chinese travelers. So when Chinese are traveling overseas, most of businesses have difficulties to actually make them pay. And actually, uh, because uh, China is so digitalized, it's pretty easy through a QR code. And that's what you are doing. You're helping uh, foreign businesses from Europe, from maybe the US, you will tell us more about it, to be able to sell to Chinese um, when they're traveling overseas. So you are exactly. the company in January 2016, as far as I understand, it's three year anniversary was like three months ago. Um, you have uh, mm -hmm. also uh, developed services to support the marketing of those companies. Uh, that's something we may talk a bit slightly uh, later on. But first, first of all, thank you very much for being with us on a Saturday uh, morning, so early, 8 a.m. Paris time uh, and 2, 2 p.m. Uh, Ch China time. And so, what about the introduction? What is correct? Yes. I'm so surprised uh, for how much information you can dig out from internet searching. And uh, yes, it's exactly correct about our company. Um, so I want to start with uh, introducing myself and uh, how I came up with the idea of creating SickPay. Um, my name is Annie Guo and uh, I originally came from China. I did my study uh, in Paris in 2001 in a business school called HEC. And then afterwards I moved to, uh, to London to work in banking industry. During a personal trip in 2015 to Beijing, I found out that uh, I become a stranger to my own country in the sense that everywhere people is paying with their mobile phone, with a wallet, a real wallet, but for example, when I take, took a taxi in, uh, in Beijing and the taxi driver refused me paying him in cash in RMB, I was so surprised. He insisted that I use my e-wallet on my phone by, to pay him by Alipay or WeChat Pay like everyone, everyone else in China. So suddenly I realized I become a stranger in China, in my own country, and uh, I can feel the pain that the Chinese travelers, when they come visit Europe, and they cannot, not, not just because of the language barrier, but also they can no longer use their, their favorite way of paying in, in, in Paris or anywhere else in Europe. So that is why I came up with the idea of creating SigPay and to be a partner of Alipay and WeChat Pay to uh, educate the European merchants uh, about this way, new way of paying, new way of life. Actually, yeah, that's the thing. Um, you so silk pay in order to for the audience to be able to to spell it silk uh, s i l k and pay payment afterwards. So you you are uh, helping those Chinese travelers to be able to continue to use the same system, which are mainly actually and if not exclusively AliPay and we we pay uh, in 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 Europe. Mainly. But first of all, could you tell us now what's the size of your business? If, if you could share some numbers about the revenues, about the number of payments, which, which uh, went through your, your system, number of people in your company, number of clients, uh, for, for the people who are listening to us to know where you, you are in your development. Okay, sure. Um, so as you said that the name is called Silk Pay and the, the, the Silk is, uh, comes from the Silk Road. That's the uh, ancient road that links uh, China to the rest of the world and uh, to uh, enable the, the trade between the, the, the China and the rest of the world. And which is also uh, SigPay, our company's mission is to uh, enable and facilitate the payment and the trade between China and Europe. 
um, since uh, the project took off in 2016, and the company was really created in July uh, 2017. Um, okay. So it has been a little bit over two years, and now our headquarter is based in an, uh, in uh, Paris, uh, in central Paris, and uh, we have a team of 15 pe people, a person based in Paris. And we have uh, now we are present in 11 countries across Europe. Uh, in terms of uh, our clients' presence, uh, we have nice. roughly yeah we have a uh, roughly 500 merchants uh, in uh, in France. Uh, we have processed over 250. Uh, we have served 250,000 uh, Chinese travelers in Europe. Uh, a monthly, for example, a number that we can say is a monthly volume of payment that we process is, a, is a about five, uh, 5 million euro in value. Uh, so um, we, we are quite happy about the, the speed of the things, how it develops. Uh, we have been increasing our numbers, our uh, customer base by 15% monthly uh, since our creation. Uh, and also uh, we have been able to fund investors to fund our company, our uh, development. We have done a, a, a round of fundraising in uh, uh, January 2018 with uh, some local business angels, French business angels. And uh, we raised about uh, 565,000 euro with those business angels. I see. I thank you very much for all the numbers. So uh, can, can, I think the, the, um, the question that people are going to ask themselves when they listen to the numbers and the volume you are um, you are managing like 5 million euros month, uh, monthly of transactions. How, what's your business model? How do you charge your clients? Um, our business model is quite simple for the merchants. Basically, we only charge the commission fees. We don't have any uh, installation or maintenance fee. Everything is free. Um, they can choose one solution to another. There is no incremental charges. Uh, we only charge a percentage based on the transaction volume that we process for the merchants. So uh, it is it's quite easy for the merchant to, ab to adopt our solution because uh, if they don't use it, if they don't have any Chinese travelers come to pay, that there is free for them, completely Understood. free. Could you share with us the numbers? In terms of percentage, for instance, we know Amazon is taking 15% as a marketplace, for instance. We know Tmall is taking 6 to 10% as a marketplace. What are the numbers for WeChat Pay, Alipay, and your service? I, I yeah. think uh, people need to know that uh, we are not talking about payment in China. So we are talking about cross-border payment, which is more sophisticated. And I, as far as I understand, there are some third-party players, even in China, which are helping um, businesses um, to be able to um, invoice and to make uh, Chinese uh, clients pay, even if the business is out of China. We know Xiaong Shu, we know all the, all the players. Could you share about the cost of going through your, your, your platform? Yes, we have a one single uh, flat fee, which is 1.6%. Uh, uh, um, that is a number that we're going to, um, to deduct from the final amount that we're going to transfer to our merchant's account. So- It's very low. Yes. It's very low, it's very low. You need a lot of volume to make, to make a sizable amount of money, right? Yes, uh, that's why we also provide the digital marketing services uh, to our merchants. And uh, we believe that uh, that is the added value to our merchants. So we not only process the payment, but we also have this digital marketing service to help the merchants to increase their visibility uh, in front of the Chinese tourists and uh, help them to uh, also uh, uh, make the Chinese tourists loyal to the, their shops. Uh, yeah, the, the retention is a big topic. We may come back to that uh, later on. They, they can still buy from the product, from the, the shop, once they are back to China. I think that's a very, very big topic to Daigo, uh, direct Daigo from, from the shop. Um, to, going back to, um, uh, to your, 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 your model, uh, you said it's your, your offering. Why is it so complicated for shops to do that by themselves? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, a, a payment system 
Even the coffee shop can do it in China. Even if, oh, you know, even the beggars can do it. Even the street artist can, can have a QR code to get paid. Why is it so complicated for foreign businesses to do it? Uh, the reason is because they can't do it directly because uh, there are two uh, systems, uh, two ways of working in China and the rest of the world. Um, that is uh, how the, the system of Alipay and WeChat Pay works. Because uh, there is a, when we talk about payments uh, in uh, Europe or in US or any else, uh, where else in the world, it's a different system. It's a cross-border payment. It involves exchange RMB, which is the Chinese local currency, to the local currency of the merchants. And uh, for the, um, if we talk about the Europe, that would be Euro. So there is this uh, foreign exchange involved. That makes the matter a little bit more complicated, considering uh, Chinese government has a, a very tight control in terms of uh, how the money flows in and out of China. Right. So right. it's a different scenario. Uh, and that adds uh, a, li a little bit more layer of complicity to the, the, to the payment solutions. So, okay. uh, in essence, the, the merchants in Europe, they cannot um, just talk directly to Alipay and WeChat Pay and say, I want to install those uh, payment solutions at my shops. They have to go through a third party uh, partner of Alipay and WeChat Pay, such as uh, a sick pay. Um, for example, if you think about Visa and MasterCard, they're actually large groups. And why not just a coffee shop go directly to Visa MasterCard and say that I want to accept your payment means in my shop. That is not possible. They have to go to a local bank or a local payment company right. and to ask them to install Visa at MasterCard acceptance in their shops. It's exactly the same way as for Alipay and WeChat Pay. You need to go to your local bank or to a third party like myself to accept those payment means. I see, I see. Actually, I think the irony of, of, of your market in France is that Visa and MasterCard uh, have not penetrated the very low level payment. Like if you go to a, to a coffee shop in France, if you spend less than 10 euros, that will just ask you to pay in cash. In some way, for, for Chinese tourists, it may be easier to pay uh, small, small transactions with your solution than for French people. Uh, that, that, that could be the funny thing. Um, you say 1.6%. Uh, I understand now more about the complexity of foreign businesses uh, invoicing um, Chinese clients. 1.6%, does it include the, um, the conversion rate? Does it include all the fees? Or there, there are all the fees to consider? Mm, as for the payment part, there is no fees to consider. Um, everything is included, actually. So okay. it's a comparable to the fees that the merchant might pay to Visa and MasterCard. We have I to see. be competitive as of payment means, because otherwise okay. the merchant would just prefer to ask the Chinese customer to pay in cash or pay in cards. Yeah, yeah. So um, how did it work? Uh, the Chinese client is going to pay with WeChat or Alipay. Is going to be the money is going to be taken out of the bank account in China, in GMB, mm -hmm. and it's going to arrive on the bank account of the shop. Let's take a, a small shop, like a, a, a drugstore, a pharmacy in France. And uh, uh, they're going to receive in euros, I'm correct? Mm -hmm. The shop is going yes. to receive the money in euro, deleted by the 1.6%. Um, how much time does it take? Um, depends. In some cases, it's two days, sometimes three days. Depends on if they falls on the weekend or bank holiday or not. Yes. So it's a two to three days. You can say. I see. I see. Um, what technology have you developed in order to offer this service? Uh, have you been able to develop a specific technology with the API of, of WeChat, Alipay, um, or you are leveraging an existing technology and making it more not, more now within the European market? I feel you are filling two gaps. You are filling a mm -hmm. knowledge gap. Those shops mm -hmm. don't know that Chinese uh, consumers are using WeChat and Alipay. That's what you provide to, to those clients that is a knowledge gap. And you are filling also a technological gap. The knowledge gap, I fully understand it and I think it's very, very easy to understand. But the technology, technological gap, uh, what are you offering on top of the existing solutions in China? Have you had to develop something? 
uh, we have to develop to adapt to the local market needs. We have to think about the French market, for example. 80% of transactions are paid by cars, bank cars. So every shop is equipped with uh, the facility to accept a, a payment made by card. But it is completely different technology because the Chinese e-wallets, such as Alipay and WeChat Pay, they are based on the uh, QR code uh, technology, which is uh, nobody use it actually in Europe because they prefer the other one, which is a non-touch technology. So basically they just use the e-wallet or the card to touch the, the reader to make the payment. That is the most popular technology in, uh, in Europe. Um, then, so we are introducing uh, the solution adapted to the QR code technology, which is used by all the Chinese mobile uh, payment companies. So, so what we are offering them, the, the setup is for free. So you are meeting with them, you sign a contract with them to say, you will be the, I guess you, you, are, you are asking them for an exclusivity to be the exclusive partner for Chinese uh, uh, buyers, I, I, I find it then, and then you help them to connect with Alipay and WeChat Pay, plus creating what we, we, you call a static QR code. So because QR, QR codes can change actually all the time, linked to the same identity, but they can change all the time. So you're creating a static QR code, which is not changing. That's, that's what you're offering to them, connecting to the platform, plus getting a QR code. Yes, as a part of our service, we actually offer six different ways of accepting Alipay, WeChat Pay in their shop. Depends on the situation of the merchants. The static okay. QR code is the mostly, most widely used ones uh, in, among our clients because purely because of the simplicity of the sub method. So once the client's account is open, we just need to email them an image of their uh, QR code. They print it out on a color printer and that's it. They are, they're ready to go. Um, but other solutions will involve, for example, we can give their uh, a, a scanner machine, uh, which we have to train them about how to use a scanner machine. And with a scanner machine, they can generate with with a pulse machine you can call it and you can generate an image of a dynamic qr code which can change transaction by transaction uh, and also they can use a machine to scan the phones of the chinese users so uh, this kind of machine is uh, uh, the, the shops they don't really have them and uh, we can equip them with the machine to enable them to accept payments and there are other solutions for example we can integrate uh, the, our solutions into their cashier system. It is a compulsory in France for the retailers to be equipped with a cashier system, which will register all the transactions pass through the shop for the fiscal reasons. And uh, also then we can integrate our solutions into those cashier machines and the, the shop uh, owner can simply use their scanner attached to their uh, cashier machine to scan the telephones of Chinese uh, travelers. Those systems, all the hardwares, they already have it in the shop. They can just use our software, our APIs, and to, you know, to enable those, uh, those uh, acceptance uh, solutions. You have creating your own API? Oh yes, yeah, so we do have our own API, yes. Okay, and this API is connecting then to Salesforce and other solutions which are prevalent in, the, in, the, in, in Europe, in France, is it? Well, the, the, the shops actually use a different uh, cashier uh, systems. There are about a thousand of them in France. So there isn't, yeah, predominant use ones, no. So it is a, a meta case by case. 10 shops can have 10 different, com complete different systems. I understand. So it's, it's even more than the payment system is that you're integrating, you're connecting with a CRM, you're also making it compliant and legal for them to use it because, as you said, there is a, leg, um, um, a um, legal uh, uh, challenge uh, with a cashier uh, to connect with the taxes, um, which is actually very established already in China with a five-year system. 
uh, I see. So it's it's much more actually than the payment system only. Um, you yeah. mentioned that you are also on your website. That's the thing I, I before we, we, we started, I, I mentioned to you that it's on your website, it's mentioned that you are also providing marketing services, uh, managing web or managing web chat, web chat and so on. Uh, I feel now that it was very natural for you uh, to begin to push your clients to use those marketing tools, maybe not doing that yourself, but at least to work with partners and, and other, other people in order to, to provide the system. Because first, when you, have the, when you receive the payment of someone, you can get the WeChat identity. So you can push yes. them to follow you. Secondly, when someone is buying a, a product in Paris, you may want to continue to sell when they're back to China. And the, 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 the WeChat, for instance, let's talk about WeChat. WeChat is so involved in the daily life of everyone that it would actually uh, pop up in a, in, on a daily basis. So I, I see, the, I see the, the interest of offering a, um, a marketing services. Can you tell us more about what you feel uh, is necessary and the most effective for those businesses in order to continue to sell uh, with their um, clients uh, in China? Yes, uh, I think what you say is very important because uh, uh, from uh, uh, the European merchants' perspective, they uh, think the Chinese market is so far away, is it so difficult to understand and to penetrate. Uh, but actually, there are some uh, existing solutions, which is uh, very easy to use, doesn't uh, cost really um, a huge budget. You just need to uh, be smart about it, not to be afraid of using them. And then you can convert all these Chinese visitors into, competitive, uh, into repetitive uh, uh, users, visitors of your e-shops. So uh, this is a really a virtual cycle that uh, uh, by adopting a WeChat Pay in the, shop, in the shops, that you can convert other Chinese users um, into the uh, loyal uh, customers of the, the e-shop of the same brand. So basically, we provide this uh, 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 marketing tools. For example, we can help the brand to create the, the e-shop based on the WeChat. And then the, uh, the, 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 the Chinese travelers who has paid with WeChat, they will uh, um, become um, uh, members of this uh, e-shop. They will continue to follow the, the WeChat official account of the shop or the brand and they can continue to buy, to make the purchase uh, through the, the WeChat eShop that uh, the, the shop, uh, the, the, the brand will connect to their WeChat the official account. I have a technical question on this. Um, I, uh, I saw that you could not open an official account if you didn't have a Chinese company. Does it mean that it's you are- It's no longer the that... situation. Okay, okay. So yeah. any, any foreign business with their foreign license can open a WeChat page official account. Um, yes. I don't know if it's a Fuha or the, the other one. Um, and also a shop on WeChat with, um, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah, because um, WeChat actually is a, is a Tencent, is a constantly changing, constantly changing um, company. Their way of doing businesses and the functionalities they provide change month on month basis. So w that is not possible until September last year. Uh, but since then, things have has changed. Now they are adding uh, more foreign countries where the foreign uh, companies can directly own a Chinese uh, WeChat official account and uh, thus enable Chinese uh, travelers to buy or consumers based in China to buy directly from their eShop. That is possible I... right now. So we help our French merchants to open a WeChat official account, then attach eShop on it, and then convert all the travelers into uh, frequent buyers of, of these WeShops. I see. Could you tell us about, in, in this case, if the Chinese consumer, client, is back to China and uh, needs to, to get the product delivered, because I guess it's most of the time product and services, uh, get the product delivered, what are the taxes, what are the restrictions, legal restrictions and taxes you have to be applied 
you 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 have to 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 apply. Well, um, since the January uh, two thousand nineteen, um, the Chinese government has issued a new law to uh, regulate exactly the cross border e commerce activities between uh, China and the rest of the world. And uh, with this new law, it says that th there are a lot of uh, um, uh, details about the law, but it, it, essentially, uh, the cross border entities like the French shops, they can legally sell things across border to China and by paying the, the, the customer's fees. And the customs fees is actually quite reasonable. For example, if we take a uh, very popular French goods, which is a red wine made, made in Bordeaux, um, uh, that the taxes apply on it for the cross-border trade is only 20%. And so I if see. we can uh, it could if we be take VAT, it, right? Sorry? Including VAT, no other tax. Uh, yeah, but actually uh, VAT is only apl uh, applicable um, when it is the sales in Europe, in the same, uh, you know, VAT zone. And if we will sell it uh, to China, I don't think we can, we, we need to apply for the VAT. That's yeah, exactly. where it comes the, 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 the idea of tax-free shopping, right? So because the Chinese consumers, they don't have to pay the VAT apply to the European consumers. So, um if we take the example of a, a couple of bottles of Bordeaux wine uh, exported from di directly delivered from a, a, a Bordeaux producer to the doorfront of the Chinese consumer, and what basically the Chinese consumer will be, be charged is 20% of the customer's uh, uh, taxes plus uh, some delivery fees. And the delivery fee is quite reasonable, actually, based on the uh, volume and the weight of the goods. But in case of the a couple of bottles of wine, it's somewhere between 13 to 20 euro, and which makes the total bill to be something around 20 to 30 euro. And if we compare the price that they, they purchase those bottles of wine directly from the producer is much lower than the price they can find for the equivalent products in China. And also, the, what is very important is that the, 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 the authenticity of the products is nearly guaranteed because you buy directly from the producer. But we all know that in China, there's a huge problem about the, the counterfeit goods. So you're never sure that what you buy is really what you want to buy. It's very interesting, and I think actually it's raising a lot of other questions. Um, uh, first question being that why the Chinese government is is, is uh, um, helping uh, foreign businesses to actually be more competitive than uh, local importers and local distributors, which are have to apply. Um, I think it's a total of forty eight percent of bottle of wine, yeah. including the AT. So that, that's a question I am still very very. Uh, um, I don't. I. 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 A very. Uh, uh, I, I. don't have an, an understanding of how to explain why the Chinese government is pushing. I, I think there are um, uh, a few. I have a few ideas about the um, why Chinese government is uh, helping foreign business to do business with China. One thing is that they can't stop them. Um, whatever they do, foreign business will consider. Well, the Chinese government. Uh, uh, the market, consumer market, is one of the most important ones in the world. And all foreign businesses will try to do business with Chinese consumers anyway. Um, and if they don't uh, have this transparent and uh, quite favorite taxing system, then that will be Daigo, you know, the personal shoppers. Uh, you know, if I want to explain the Daigo that actually are the Chinese like but actually not paying any taxes at all so instead of you know encouraging the daigo the gray area the chinese government just uh, issued this new law which will encourage a uh, business to do things in a very transparent and legal way and to encourage that the taxes applied to this new cross-border businesses is not very high so people will not really risk the sanctions to do the daigo, which is an illegal business. I see, I see. Being pragmatic, so yeah. it's, it's, the main, it's, the main, it's the main reason um, uh, market forces are too, too, too strong. Um, I see. Um, 
look, you, you were talking about uh, being able to continue to, to sell to Chinese clients on their back uh, to, to China. So you pretty well explained uh, the, the case of, of, of wine. Wine, uh, I feel, doesn't require too much um, um, regulation. You, you, can, you can send a, a wine, uh, you don't have to do tests and so on. But that's not the case for cosmetics. What about uh, products which are a bit more touchy? Uh, I'm thinking about food, I'm thinking about infant formula, I'm thinking about cosmetics, I'm thinking even about drugs, about uh, medicine. Uh, do, do you have restrictions? And the second point is with logistics. You talked about wine, and that's also, uh, that's also applying for wine. When you send wine, you have to be pretty careful on the temperature, uh, on the humidity level, and so on. Uh, th those two questions are both in terms of regulation and uh, in terms of uh, conditions of logistics. How do you, how do you work on this? Well, um, in terms of the, this new cr uh, cross-border law, and if you send the small quantities across by the, uh, the post, actually um, you, you don't really have to be compliant to the Chinese um, food and, and safety uh, regulations that uh, you don't really have to register with those uh, uh, Chinese uh, ministries. Uh, which is a very, I, I mean, a lot of uh, French cosmetic brands are relieved because it is really costly to pass those tests. And uh, that will, um, for example, if you take a, a brand like uh, Laven, then they have, uh, you know, thousands of uh, SKUs. So each SKU has to be examined in Chinese laboratory, and every time they change the formula or the ingredients of their cosmetic products, they have to repass those tests. It's really costly and time consuming, and, uh, and the Chinese government will ban uh, certain ingredients, um, and, uh, the, the, which is quite widely used in Europe. So by using this new system that uh, um, we can send things with puzzles, um, the, the, the cosmetic brands, they do not really have to pass those laboratory tests and register with the Chinese ministries. Yeah, again, I think for uh, European ears, I mean, um, it sounds so surprising, all this, when you, you listen to the government saying, Google has to pay taxes, Apple has to pay taxes in France, and the Chinese government saying, pay a lower tax, sell from overseas, don't, don't uh, follow exactly the same rules uh, because anyway, the market is working this way. So we are going to take our, um, our, 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 the taxes we can out of it. I feel that, that that's the idea and, and we are going to actually apply different rules. But that sounds a little bit surprising, isn't it? Uh, yes, but I think all be behind it, there is are some political reasons as well. Like, uh, all these things will contribute to to build uh, Chinese power globally. Imagine that uh, by encouraging foreign business to sell directly to China, and uh, that basically just closely link the the foreign business to the Chinese interest. And uh, even the small producer of Bordeaux wine or an, or uh, a biscuit shops in Paris that can feel the importance of China and the, the, the economic power behind it that they, they can't feel before. Now they, 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 they sense it. And if, you know, there is a, some problem between Europe and China and the, the people, the businesses in Europe, they will feel so much pain that that is actually a political pressure on it. So... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we saw that with um, actually the solar panel and the wine industry. I mean, solar panel was banned from China to export to, to Europe, uh, I think a few years ago, maybe half a yeah. decade ago. And uh, China reacted by uh, putting restrictions on, on wine, uh, affecting many fronts. So, and that was a bit painful for, for wine producers. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the, I, I interviewed a couple of companies working especially with influencers, uh, KOL, key opinion leaders, um, could be uh, with live streaming, uh, and I interviewed uh, Lauren Adenan yesterday, uh, but also with platforms within China, like Serong Chu, 
uh, or uh, with a platform dedicated for finding care like Parkloo. Do you think that the people who are buying in scrums from the shops could be converted on their back to China as a care well or an influencers and uh, being able actually to create um, evangelists of the brand, of the product. Have you, have you worked on, 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 on the product or uh, have you pushed your clients to, to do that with their existing database? Yeah, it is a very controversial issue. I, I feel that uh, uh, we sense that uh, more and more um, the influencers and the Xiaohongshu and those kind of platforms, they uh, dominate the, the voices, that the, the images and the, the messages the brand can send to the Chinese consumers. That uh, those are the, the most efficient ways for the, the brands to communicate to Chinese consumers. And, uh, but um, every French businesses that I speak to, they find that the, the pricing um, charged by the Chinese uh, influencers is so many times more than the equivalent uh, stars or influencers will charge in Europe. So it is not really um, everybody's uh, uh, within everybody's budget to communicate through the Chinese KOLs, and uh, only the, the the big businesses in uh, in uh, Europe or the the luxury industries with uh, a high margin will be able to afford it. Is um, uh, for a lot of our customers just because their margin is so thin that they cannot possibly uh, use these kind of uh, tools to communicate and to build their image um, with the Chinese consumers, which is uh, quite a shame. And uh, I, I think that there will be uh, with the technology is uh, developing, uh, and there is a so little the, the knowledge gap between the Chinese consumers and the, the rest of the world is actually narrowing quite rapidly. And uh, one day, you know, we don't really need to depend on the influencers to be the advocate of the brands or or products made in Europe just by the virtue of the you know the of this products it will speak for themselves and the, through you know different channels the Chinese customers can acquire as much knowledge and the uh, information about those products as the European consumers but today because of the language barrier, because of different lack of uh, you know channels, effective channels, the Chinese consumers cannot get the uh, right and uh, enough information about the, what the real products and services are in uh, in Europe. So I thus, see. the influencer will be uh, play a very big role now for the moment. Yeah, uh, and um, have you um, so uh, have you? worked with CRM company or have you thought about developing a system so that the clients you have in France from a drugstore could actually resell or could advertise on, on the product they bought like you know Pinduoduo was doing like uh, uh, getting uh, uh, you, you, you invite your friends so you get a discount from them you can uh, is it, a, is it a, I feel that's something you have thought you should you certainly have thought about it in order to to scale a bit more the presence of those those companies in China without being present physically. Have you have you, have you already worked on it? Have you thought about it? Yeah, um, there, there are. We, we need need to um, understand that the gap between what the consumers Chinese consumers want, how they uh, the, the, their behavior, and the, what the European market the merchants think. The European mar merchants. They are more concentrated on their offering and the, the image and the positioning of their brand than doing discount to increase the sales. They, they don't want to, the, the Chinese, what we can see on the Chinese market is that without the discount, without promotions, you can't sell anything nearly. You, one is a full price. Nobody's going to buy it. Everybody will wait for the, you know, uh, the, the single day or, you know, another offerings. And they always wait for the, for the promotion campaign to come. They know they were coming, but it's not the case in Europe. There are so many brands, you know, the um, luxury brands or they, they don't do, they don't sell on promotions. They don't never do promotions actually. 
And a lot of China, uh, the European uh, business and brands, they think that way. They think a promotion is bad, it's damaging their image. So we still need to do the education. You know, one or another, there is not a right answer, but we need to narrow the gap to make sure the yeah. two of them can match somehow. Yeah, because I think you have two, two levels of growth. Uh, I, I, sorry? Oh, sorry, going to, sorry, yeah, I was interrupting you, sorry. But I think you have two levels of growth, getting more bundles, getting more clients, and expanding the database of each client. And expanding the database of each client necessarily uh, is a China topic. It's a China, I mean, it's within China. The, the, the returning clients, the clients who could come from the returning clients and so on. And getting more clients for, for you, more clients for, for, for you, uh, I, I understand it's, it's, a, it's a European business, but then to get returning uh, consumers for your vendors, your clients, it's going to be a China, a China, uh, a China business. Well, I was asking uh, the question and how you can create a snowball, creating more, in, more followers, more, more audience for all those businesses. One question about your location. Um, you are in Paris. That I understood. You went to HEC. Uh, I, I understand you work. You work for some time, a long time, to HSBC and HSBC. That's something I would like to go back later on. Uh, and Barcelona and Lyon. So could you explain why the small locations? Uh, actually, we have an edit office in Venice. Uh, we, the locations actually uh, are based on the, the frequency of uh, the Chinese travelers and the, the, the strategic importance of the market. Uh, Barcelona is because it's uh, one of the most visited country, uh, cities in Europe. And uh, uh, Lyon is the second uh, largest uh, city in France. And Venice is simply because it's uh, one of the favorite destinations uh, of Chinese tourists in Europe. And I would think the number will increase. Um, and the, the most important in terms of Chinese travelers, the most important country in Europe is France. 2.2 uh, million of Chinese travelers visited France last year with uh, the, you know, the Gideon or, you know, the, the social movement that disturb the, uh, every Saturday uh, the business in Paris, the number of Chinese visitors has decreased because of the fear of safety and uh, the problem. But we hope that uh, that will uh, resolve this kind of social issues and uh, the Chinese uh, travelers will, will, will still come back to, the, to Paris. So yeah, for those who are, and for, 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 a number of people, yeah. Yeah, one minute for those who are listening to us who don't speak French, the, the Gilets Jaunes is a yellow jacket. It's a, it's a movement of protest in France, which is happening every Saturday, which is a bit surprising, but that's the way it works. And uh, they, they actually are on the major avenues of, of Paris, and there have been a lot of damages some, some Saturdays, and it has been um, on, on, on every TV in the world, so some Chinese, I guess, uh, I've been a bit scared and, um, and um, at least puzzled on what, 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 what's going on. So you were saying that it has decreased a little bit, but still, I, I guess it's a, it's a major force within the tourism industry, uh, Chinese tourists. Yes. Yeah. The, said, yeah. yeah you're talking uh, about Lyon, but Nice seems to be one of the biggest, uh, I mean, I, 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 from, if I had to say which cities Chinese tourists go, I would say Paris first and Nice second. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't have thought about Lyon, to be honest. Yes, but Lyon actually is also because it's very close to, uh, to Switzerland. It's actually uh, convenient to go to Switzerland. Our Lyon office also covers the Switzerland uh, market. Switzerland is a very interesting market because uh, there is a 1 million Chinese visitors every year visiting Switzerland. And oh, in terms huge. of... That is a huge, I know. <laughs> It is not just uh, leisure travelers, but also business travelers. We can consider there are full Chinese ambassadors in, uh, uh, in Switzerland. That is, I don't know any other European countries have full Chinese ambassadors. It's because there is a one ambassador to the country in Bern, uh, which is the capital of Switzerland. And there are like three of them based in uh, Geneva because of uh, Geneva's uh, uh, diplomatic uh, position. There is the UN, etc., uh, uh, organizations, and the Chinese send ambassadors to them. So there are many business and political travelers uh, to Switzerland, and they are very uh, high-spending consumers. And the top 
uh, products that Switzerland sell are the, the, um, the watches. And uh, so this is a very important market for people like us who uh, facilitate cross-border uh, transactions. So yeah, that's I why we choose the Lyon. <laughs> yeah, collecting 1.6% on the watch on the, from, from, from Switzerland may be much more much much better bet for you than collecting from instant formula uh, or from a croissant in, exactly. in Paris. Right? Exactly. And there I isn't understand. much competition yet in Switzerland as I in see. France. I see. We talked before before we started, uh, we talked about the need of getting a license in, in Europe. Uh, you talked to a journalist uh, online, I mean, I saw the article when preparing the interview, uh, that you were thinking or you were getting, or you just got, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's some news about it, uh, a license to be more independent. Could you tell us more about what license and why you need that? Yeah, um, uh, in uh, uh, payment businesses, uh, it is uh, regulated by the European Union um, that every payment company has to have a payment license. Uh, every country issue their own payment license, but if you get one in one country, you can passport it uh, across to uh, 26 countries across Europe. So that is why we uh, don't have a payment license yet, and we are in the process of getting one. Uh, hopefully we'll get it by the end of this year. Um, now, how we do our business? We are agent of uh, the payment company with a European license, which allow us to do business already without getting a license ourselves. What is the payment company? Could you give some names? Uh, yes, well, there are so many of them and we work uh, with a number of them so that we can cover all the geographies. For example, we work with a core hotel group and they have 4,000 hotels last year uh, now they have more across the world. And so we work with different um, payment companies in US, in Australia, in Asia, in Europe, so that we can enable a core hotel group to get Alipay and WeChat Pay in all the countries they cover. I, I don't remember the number, but they cover like 60 or 80 countries across, across the world. There were some of the African countries never heard of. And then the, uh, we need to cover the Alipay and WeChat Pay in those hotels as well. That's why we work with a number of payment companies across the world. But a payment company license, uh, is it what uh, Visa, Mastercard have? Is it what PayPal, Stripe have? Is it what, um, what, what I, I don't really get the, the license system, how, why it would be helpful for you uh, to, to, to use it. How, is it going to lower your fees? Is it going to make it possible for you to, yeah. Yeah, it won't lower my fees, but it will increase my margin because now we are agents of other payment companies. So we, we depend on their system and we need to pay them for using their service. And once we become a payment company ourselves, uh, we will save money on the payment we make to those payment uh, services companies. So Don't that will increase our margin. I, uh, I, I think I, I begin to get it. That, so. Does it mean that the transaction, does it mean that you will not have to go through a third party when um, a trans, trans, the transition, the transfer, sorry, from the Chinese bank account to the French bank account is, is done? Does it mean that this, this yeah, transfer fine, fine. will be fully processed yeah. by you instead of going through those third parties, like maybe uh, every bank has one of them and they charge you, but you will not have to do that anymore? Is it? Is it what, what it means? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. We will change. We will. We will save money on the fees. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, the, the finance sector is very regulated. It is very tightly regulated in Europe. Uh, so that is why uh, the payment service industry is regulated as well. And so um, to do business uh, uh, independently, we need to have this payment license with uh, within the European Union. Uh, what, what does it mean you, it's difficult to get? What, what do you need to do? Do you need to, to pay? Do you need to show a lot of documents? Do you need to comply to a lot of, of uh, elements? Yeah, the, the, the entry barrier is actually quite high. Uh, otherwise, everybody will be able to become a, a, a payment company. Um, we, uh, the laws are very strict and they will look at your, um, your company structure 
look at how you do business, your procedure. You have to document every single thing you do throughout the day. Um, you have to ask for a lot of documents of your customer. And uh, this is what we call the uh, KYC, know your customer, uh, which means that the merchants uh, that we sign with, they have to provide us with a number of documents to prove their business, to prove who is the, the, the real owner behind these businesses. And that causes a lot of uh, actually uh, questions and uh, uh, oppositions from the merchant because they don't understand why they need to give me, for example, the, the passport and the, the proof of address of their, their owner. Sometimes uh, uh, for the big companies, they, the owner doesn't want us to know he's the real owner behind the business. So yeah, it is, uh, we, we are asked by the regulators to do that. And we have to do that. We understand why they want us to do it. But in, uh, to enforce it is quite, uh, it's quite a difficult task. I see. Last question before we end. Um, you have been vice president of HSBC uh, for the MNA department. How is it to transit from uh, being in a very nice office from a very big company, having uh, a lot of comfort to actually starting from zero and um, the motivation behind this? Could you, could you share a little bit? Uh, I think that uh, eight years at the uh, invest, investment banking industry uh, is a very uh, is is a very good experience and very interesting. I have been uh, working with very interesting uh, people and on some uh, you know new some deals that uh, on the newspapers. And uh, but I think that uh, working for uh, other people is to realize helping others to realize their own dreams. But actually, uh, at a certain age, I want to start to realize my own dream. Uh, and I think I have something to say and some opinions to express. And I can only do it by starting my own uh, outlet, which is uh, uh, why I started to create my own business. Yeah, and I truly have... in the potential that uh, the mobile payment can have in the European market. Because uh, now the market share of mobile payments is so small, and then can only increase in the future. I talked with a, um, um, another Chinese who used to work in banking, uh, investment banking, and dropped because she wanted to start a business, but also to be able to work more on with China. And uh, an investment bank was not giving her opportunity to work with China, and she was seeing China developing so fast and not being able to actually leverage it. So I feel there's a lot, lot of Chinese who are in, uh, in Europe and not export in, enough to China, so they want to actually do the, the, their things themselves. What about the next step for you? Uh, what are the next developments? So we understand the license to be more independent. What is the next development for CIFPAY? Um, we are always in, uh, in, the, in the process of acquiring more merchants, and uh, we will cover more uh, territories uh, in Europe or outside of Europe. We're looking for partners to accelerate our uh, development in uh, different countries. And we are also uh, in the process of uh, raising, uh, do another round of fundraising, because you know, this is uh, like uh, the gunpowder that will enable us to accelerate our development. So uh, yeah, those are, are the, the main things we are doing, fundraising and going to different countries. Okay, congratulations for all you've done in such a short time, actually. Um, I understood now it was like not even two years uh, you officially started. So congrats for everything you did and hopefully you enjoyed it and hopefully all the listeners enjoyed the, the talk. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.